When I began this series four weeks ago, I told you that I am doing this because I really sincerely believe that unless someone understands the Bible chronologically and in terms of the way God has dealt with his people and with his creation from the beginning in forms of covenants, I really don't think you can fully understand the Scripture the way God wants us to. And so we have begun talking about God's covenants, and there will, um, there will only be one lesson where we don't discuss that, and that's next week. And the reason being is God's covenants are in pretty rapid form in the beginning of the Bible, in the first few chapters of Genesis. Now, there is a big difference between Genesis chapters 1 through 10 and the rest of Scripture. And I'll talk about that next week, but I, we're not going to talk about a covenant next week. We are going to talk about where you came from, where all your people came from. I just bet you, you are going to learn more next week than you could learn from Ancestry.com or 23andMe. That's all I'll say. But you've got to know this before you can apply God's words and ways and covenants uh, concretely to your life, I believe. I think it's the only way to know them. So we've already discussed the Edenic covenant, E-D-E-N, which spends, talks about God's covenant in Eden. And then last week we talked about the Adamic covenant, A-D-A-M-I-C, which talks about God's covenant with Adam. And tonight we're going to move into what happened after the time of Adam, and we're going to discuss the Noahic covenant, what exactly God's covenant with Noah was. But before we get to Noah, you have to understand what happened between where we left off last week with uh, Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden, what happened then in that time period between then and the great flood that caused the Noahic covenant that we will read about in Genesis chapter 9. But before we start discussing the Noahic covenant, let's uh, Let's just re be reminded of a few important tidbits. Someone has posted the lessons from Noah's Ark. I really like number three there, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. As we've talked about in this series, it wasn't. It had never rained before. Uh, I like number four there, keep yourself in shape. When you uh, are 600 years old, God may ask you to do something really big. I also like number five, don't listen to critics, just get on with the job that needs to be done. And number seven, it's always safer to travel in pairs. I like number nine, the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic was built by professionals. And number 10, no matter the storm when you are with God, there is always a rainbow waiting. But my favorite one on the list my favorite one on the list, and really the only reason I'm sharing the list, is number one, don't miss the boat. Don't miss the boat, because if you miss the boat, everything else is pretty irrelevant. Now remember, a covenant is an agreement between people. It sets out the terms of a relationship. It's very different from a contract. It's firmer, built on faith. And the Bible is a series of covenants God made with certain men at certain times in response to certain events. And in the Noahic covenant, it's particularly interesting because every time it rains, we are reminded of it. In fact, about a a couple of months ago, I guess it was, I preached a sermon called Rainbows and Something. I can't even remember what the other end of it was. And I talked about how much I love rainbows. And ever since then, people in the church have been sending me from their phone. That's the great thing about phones now. You see, everybody is a photographer. And so they're sending me all these beautiful rainbows. And I, the truth is, I love them. They're great. And every time it rains, we can be reminded of God's covenant with Noah and that it still stands. 
In 2007, a technician working for the state of Alaska was performing routine maintenance on a computer hard drive, and mistakenly, he reformatted not only the drive itself, but also its backup. Data disappeared as fast as you can say, oops. Over a million files lost. The state of Alaska had to bring in nearly a hundred people working around the clock, spending over a quarter of a million dollars to try to recover the data that was lost. One keystroke, a single Oops, cost the state of Alaska. And one sin cost Adam and Eve their place in the perfect garden. And one oops by Adam and Eve affected you and me. Still does. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world, Romans 5.12 says. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin, and all of life got affected. Mother Nature went bonkers. God's creation was suddenly subject to randomness. So now we're threatened by arbitrary disasters. Drought causes famine. Snowstorms shut down cities. Tsunamis wipe out coasts. Viruses threaten our way of life, if not actually take our life. All started back there in the garden. But I want you to understand this. Man's relationships with nature and work and family and most importantly God were damaged by will for error but they were not finished by a willful oops. In fact, here's what I really want you to understand from the Bible. God's intention was never to simply restore man to what he had lost. Believe it or not, Adam and Eve sitting naked by themselves under a tree munching on fruit was never God's intended outcome. Might have been good for them, but not for the rest of creation. God's goal was not to recreate the man and woman's innocence in the garden. In God's estimation, a redeemed man is superior to an innocent man. Adam and Eve were in their innocence in the garden. But God's plan was never about us being perfect and innocent. God's plan was about us being redeemed. You see, an innocent Adam and Eve had no knowledge of sin, but neither could they ever have known the joy of God's forgiveness. Neither could they ever have known the miracle of reconciliation with God. Neither could they ever have known the gift of righteousness that comes only through what I prayed about a moment ago, the living word inside of us, making us God's righteousness, not our own, no matter how good that could ever be. You see, morally and spiritually, Adam was a zero, and God's purpose and plan and goal was never to spend eternity with zeros. So here is tonight's big lesson. We gain more in Christ than we ever lost in Adam. Don't forget that. Now, I realize the first two or three weeks of the series, we've been focused on what we lost in Adam. But my goodness... We gain more in Christ by far than we ever lost in Adam. The goal of our redemption was not to return us to Adam's innocence, 
but to bless us with far more. We are clothed, the New Testament says, in His righteousness. We are blessed beyond belief. We're God's children. We are, as Romans says, heirs to His glory. None of that could ever have been subscribed to an innocent Adam. So realize a right standing with God is way superior to the innocence of Adam in the Garden of Eden. Here's how we could say it. Our fallen world that we're living in right now is not the best possible world to live in. We know that. It's full of heartache and headache and heartbreak. And we see it every day in our own lives. And if we don't see it in our own lives, we see it in the news. Or we see it in other people. Through Christ, though, one day this world will be forever redeemed from Satan's curse. Remember what we looked at last week. The promise God made was he was going to bring through the woman Eve and her offspring, one who would strike Satan's head or, or will strike uh, his head even though Satan could strike his heel. That's why when Eve births the first child born to humans, she names him Cain. Cain literally means I have him. In fact, in some translations, and there's some misunderstanding or disagreement on this, but in some uh, translations it reads, I have a Yahweh. I have a Yahweh. So chapter 4 begins in verse 1 by saying, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Some translations say, The man. The man that was the part of the promise in Genesis 3.15. Some make reference, possibly it could mean Yahweh. So intentionally there, it seems like Eve assumed her son was God's promised Savior. That's the promise he had made in Genesis chapter 3. And that would be understandable. Eve's living outside the garden now. She just experienced the labor pains that God had promised her would come. She's longing to be redeemed from the far-reaching pain that her sin caused. And she hopes, based on what God said, Cain is the answer. In fact, here's an old riddle for you. It's really old. What were Adam and Eve doing after God expelled them from the garden? They were raising Cain. You'll get that a little later and you'll think that's good. As soon as she got her baby home from the hospital, she realized just like all babies... He was self-centered and wanted what he want, when he wanted it, how he wanted it. That's the way of all babies. So understand, she's thinking, based on God's promise, all right, there's going to be one that is going to come from my offspring that is going to strike the head of this snake that deceived us. What else could she possibly have been thinking? I can't imagine there's anything else she possibly could be thinking. And she gets this baby, Cain, and she finds out Cain wasn't a savior. He was a brat. In fact, you might say Cain was a pain because he's going to prove that he was. He was born to sinful parents in a sinful world, the first child whoever was. So what more could you expect from him? And Eve is going to become painfully aware of the implications of her sin, not just for her and her husband Adam, but for the whole human race. Verse 2 says, she named her second son Abel. She gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. The word Abel means vanity. And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. 
So it doesn't take long for Eve to despair. The life that was once rich had turned to vanity. And she knew that by her naming of the second child. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, as we talked about last week, they tried to cover their shame with fig leaves. And that's our first indication that when we sin, we will try to say, I'll turn over a new leaf. People say that all the time. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. We rely on self-improvement. We trust our own efforts to cover our sin or error or oops. And God stepped in and swapped their fig leaves with what? Animal skins, because God insisted on a sacrifice. Now, that's going to be important here in just a minute. That's going to be important here in just a minute. Apparently, God taught that lesson to Adam and Eve and their family. So when the brothers grow up and they come to worship God, that message that we just mentioned is important, and so is this one. So is this one. God's covenant required a blood offering. Abel was a shepherd, and he admitted his need by bringing a lamb. He came on God's terms. Cain was a farmer. He was proud of his own accomplishments, the work of his own hand. So he offered the fruits of his harvest. That's not what God had asked for. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected the sacrifice that was built on self-effort. Cain was a pain. And rather than humble himself, Cain's pride turned to anger, and he murdered his brother Abel. Eve's son, that she said, I have given birth to the man that she thought was going to be God's promised answer, a gift. A savior was not a savior. He was a murderer. How did that feel? How do you suppose that felt? Imagine the regret she felt over her son's crime and her family's loss. Imagine how she must have felt. What have I done? Her oops in the garden had proved costly and from the first family the story of mankind just goes from bad to worse because the next few chapters of Genesis there from chapter 4 through the first few verses of chapter 6 describes what we call in theology the antediluvian world and I thought that was going to be clearer than it is on the screen so I apologize for that but Adam's immediate descendants were technologically advanced for the time, but morally corrupt and spiritually absolutely deviant. The antediluvian world, that is, the world before the deluge, it's the literal meaning, or the flood, boasted against God. The people lived in open immorality. They worshiped the occult. They crossed boundaries God had never intended. I don't have time for it tonight. But the first few verses of Genesis chapter 6, or just if you want to read them on your own in your own study, the depth of the corruption is unbelievable. So much so that verse 6 says, the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Other translations there said it grieved him that he ever made them. Wow. People made in his own image, made for the purpose to worship him and fellowship with him, and he's sorry and grieved that he ever even made them. You know, God, grief, grief, you understand grief is a love word. You can be angry or disappointed with a person and not love them, but you only grieve over a person you love. God loved mankind. And to preserve those who were made in his image, to preserve the human race, he decided to wipe out the entire antediluvian corruption and start over with one man and one family. 
The Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor, the word favor there means grace, with the Lord. While the world was going to hell in a handbasket, we're told Noah found favor or grace with the Lord. And I'm not going to go into the details of this because you've known the story since you went to Sunday school as a little child. Uh, in the next few verses, God tells Noah to build a cargo ship of gopher wood and prepare for at least two, at least is important there, two of every animal species. So Noah gets busy. He stocks up on Dramamine because he's going to be awake for a while. Well, I'm kidding about that part. He probably didn't have Dramamine. But, but he did hold up on the fly swatter. He, couldn't, he would not be able to use a fly swatter. You're going to need those fellows. You're going to need them, right? And so he gets busy building, and he builds and builds and builds and builds for decades. And when the day came, all eight of them, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives entered the ark. And guess who shut the door? The Lord closed the door behind. Can you imagine? You know, I think there are verses that we just pass over sometimes, and we don't much think about them. But have you ever had the Lord shut a door on you? I didn't think so. So can you imagine what that must be like? You've gathered all these animals and you got them and your family in, the eight of you, and you're all inside and all of a sudden the Lord shuts the door and you can't open it. There ain't nothing you're going to do about it. And then it rained and it rained and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Technically, according to other scriptures, particularly in the book of Job, underground aquifers spewed water upwards while collapsing cloud banks called rain to fall downwards. It was a global deluge. There is plenty of historical evidence and archaeological evidence to prove that. And if you were not on board the ark, don't miss the boat. It didn't matter how talented a swimmer you are or how hard you trained. You were going to die. Unless you got on board with God's plan. See, that's what all the covenants are about. Unless you get on board with God's plan, not your own. Bad things were bound to happen. Now, many scientists and Bible scholars believe that before the earth was shrouded, before the flood, the earth was shrouded in a vapor canopy that created a greenhouse effect. It's called the canopy theory. A tropical climate and lush vegetation covered the globe. Most of the globe was uh, land instead of water like it is now. Most of it water rather than land. And... The cloud cover may have filtered out solar radiation that today accelerates the aging process. That's why the early chapters in Genesis record people living 950 years like Noah or 969 the longest like Methuselah or 930 like Adam because it had never rained. There was a canopy theory, a cloud effect that was covering the radiation effects from the sun. Certainly when Noah stepped off the ark, he was walking out onto a very different planet that the world had never known before. The floodwaters had been on the earth for more than a year, churning up from the bottom of the oceans and the seas as well as coming down from above. All of a sudden, the earth is 75% water and 25% land. He's stepping off onto a whole new planet. He faced a brave new world. And here's what's interesting. Genesis 8.20 says, the first thing Noah did when he steps out is he built an altar to the Lord. And there he sacrificed as burnt offerings the animals and birds that had been approved for that purpose. You see, people assume that Noah took two of each animal on the ark. But Noah actually took seven of the animals 
that were going to be proper for sacrifice that had been approved for that purpose. Because the first thing he did was do what he knew God had commanded. A sacrifice. And I'm sure God's response to Noah's sacrifice was a welcome relief to the survivors. And God now promises at the end of Genesis chapter 8 to never destroy the earth like that again. The Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood, I will never again destroy all living things. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Things were changing. Now in Genesis 9-1, Noah begins to receive a new covenant from God, the Noahic covenant. God blessed Noah and his sons. That's all there is, just eight people. And he tells them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Huh. Eight people survived the flood. Noah, his wives, his three sons, their wives. As I'm going to talk about next week in some depth, we are all kin to one of those people, one of those four people. Well, three actually, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We are all kin to one of those three people. Where did they go to? Where did they come from? We're going to talk about that next week. But it was up to those four couples to repopulate the earth. Talk about pressure. Whew. Now, some of you would probably respond very happily to that pressure. I mean, the men knew how to populate and probably got very excited about that, but the wives knew the result of populating at that level and probably weren't quite so sure because part of their punishment had been pain with childbirth. But take the population trends over the last century and extrapolate them back 4,500 years and you end up with a world population of eight, your great 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 grandpa was Noah's son. Either Ham, Shem, or Japheth. The next two verses say all the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, all the fish in the sea will look at you with fear and terror. Do not forget that. Punch that in your brain for just a second. All the animals will look at you now with fear and terror. That presupposes they didn't prior to the flood. But I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food just as I have given you grain and vegetables. This is a strategic and far-reaching covenant here in the first three verses of Genesis chapter 9, even impacting today's world and today's diet, God sanctions the enjoyment here of bacon and burgers and steak and shrimp and wings for the first time. Prior to the flood, humans were vegetarians. After the flood, God added meat to mankind's diet. There's nothing Christian about vegetarianism. It may be better for you. I don't know. I'm not going to enter that argument one way or the other. But this was a part of God's covenant. The God of the Bible blesses us, if we so want, with barbecue ribs and sirloin steak. Whether or not that's healthy for you, that is for you to decide. But evidently, post-flood conditions on earth required a diet with extra protein because something happened to change it. You understand? It was vegetarian prior to that, 
Now they can eat meat. Maybe that implies that we needed protein in the post-flood world. I'm sure at first Noah and his furry friends were happy when the ark docked and they were all able to get off. But remember what I told you to park in your brain a minute ago? Now man and the animals are not friends. The animals view man as with terror because now man may want to eat them. He may want to hunt them down and eat them. Noah, the other seven, and the animals realize they are no longer pals. God apparently instills within the animal kingdom here a fear, he used the word terror, of man. Imagine on board the ark what it must have been like, gators, those nasty, horrible inhabitants of Gainesville, I mean um, gators, the animals, were eating out of Noah's hand. So were all the other animals. They were buddies. But from this point on, Noah and his sons need to keep their hands away from the jaws of those kind of animals. Noah's family turns into natural predators. It's now meat eaters versus man eaters. Human beings are now forced to hunt or be hunted. And this creates a new hostility. And the next verse says, I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. In other words, in contrast to the values of our modern culture today, all life is not created equal. Man alone is made in God's image, not plants, not animals. Christians believe that human life is of greater value and eternal value where plants and animals are not. They are not made in God's image. They are not of equal value. They are not eternal. That's what this is saying. Understand, I'm not advocating cruelty to either plants or animals. But the life of a dog, and especially a cat, <laughs> is not equal to that. I said that, I put my tongue in my cheek when I said it, if you saw me. The life of an aged oak tree on the campus of Stanford University is simply not on the same level as human life. It's not. It's okay for me to cut down an oak tree for firewood to warm my family. My family's needs overcome the life of a tree. It's justified to kill a cow to feed my hungry family. Hindus in India won't do that. Their family will starve to death and they won't kill the cow to eat. Human life takes priority over animals. That is why if a dog bites a man today, the dog gets put down. If we call, as we have probably a dozen times over the last 10 years, to animal control and tell them there's a gator out in our pond out front that is longer than five feet, I believe it is, it's five or six feet, they will come and get it. That's why. If a dog bites a man, he didn't kill him, he just bites a man, the dog gets put down. If a man shoots a dog for no reason, he can be fined, maybe even jailed, but he won't be put down. 
God's covenant with Noah made human life superior to either plant or animal life, and he makes it even clearer. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. Anyone who murders a fellow human must die. All life is not created equal. The next verse says, if anyone takes a human life, watch this. Here's another part of the Noahic covenant. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Capital punishment argument, the capital punishment debate. I, 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 don't, I don't see how there's a debate for Christians, for unbelievers, for people who are Bible believers, but not for Christians. Here, God institutes the death penalty, and his rationale is not simply deterrence. Does it deter or not? His rationale is a human being is made in God's image. I really don't care about the argument of deterrence. Make it or don't make it. Doesn't matter to me. As a Bible believer, it's not about deterrence anyway. It's about what the Word of God says. Now, sociologists and psychologists today will argue endlessly as to whether the death penalty deters murderers and serial killers. I'll just say it certainly deters the guy who gets the needle. But deterrence is irrelevant to me. The motive behind the death penalty isn't to cut crime or to save lives. It's to obey God's Word. Humans are made in God's image. So murder is a direct attack on God. That's the reason it is so deserving of death. That's not my idea. I don't think I could ever kill anybody. I, I don't own a gun. Probably shouldn't say that in, <laughs> on television. But I don't, I've never shot anything. I've never killed an animal. I, I guess I could, but I haven't. I certainly have never killed another person. It's not in my personality. It's not what I want to do. But that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. This is what God says. The Noahic covenant mandates capital punishment, and by inference, it institutes the idea of human government to carry it out. And then in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 13 and other passages, it says government is God's hand or authority to do that. Up until Noah's exit from the ark, there was no such thing as human government. The pre-flood world was governed by individuals' conscience, which wasn't much then. But here God assumes an objective authority to execute His will. And God goes on in the next few verses to clarify that His covenant with Noah just wasn't with Noah personally Himself, but with His descendants and all living creatures. And then God gives a final promise to seal the covenant. He said, I'm giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. Now, you know who that means? Do you know who that means? You, me. <laughs> I'm giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It's the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds, and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all of life. Now look, we know that a rainbow is an optical phenomenon where water droplets reflect light and create a prism effect. The droplets then reveal the colors of the spectrum. There probably were rainbows prior to the flood, perhaps in the garden mist. But since the flood was the first time it had actually ever rained on the earth, no human being prior to Noah had ever seen a rainbow hanging in the clouds. This was part of God's covenant. He actually said, it is the sign of my covenant. 
Now, understand the statement God made with the rainbow. God literally hung up his bow where all could see it. The Hebrew word translated rainbow refers to a bow and an arrow, a weapon of war. When God hung up his bow, he hung up his intent to never again destroy mankind that way. Here is the gist of the Noahic covenant. After the flood, I'll just bet you, every time Noah felt a raindrop on his shoulder or heard a clap of thunder in the distance, it was for Noah a crisis of faith. Every time he heard noises in the dark or in the bushes or an animal howl, the question he faced from his new enemy, the animals, was would he trust in God in a brave new world, a fallen world, and lean on God's grace? Or would he succumb to fear and doubt God's grace toward him? Every time he heard the thunderclap. You know, if for 600 years you'd never heard thunder, you'd never seen rain, and then suddenly you were on an ark for over a year, first few times it rained. You know how we are now. Irma hits, destroys some of our homes, disrupts some of our lives. We start watching for that next cone, don't we? Every time you hear an animal howl, you'd been feeding that animal. He'd been your buddy. Now he's not. You may be his food. So is he going to trust the world? Or is he going to trust God? And God's agenda from now to the end, from this point forward, is going to be salvation. Salvation, not condemnation. He had destroyed the whole world he had created, except for eight people and a few animals. Now he's going to try to save them through another series of covenants. And we're going to get to the biggie, the real biggie, two weeks from tonight, called the Abrahamic Covenant. But to get there, we're going to go through the most boring chapter in the Bible. If you don't believe me, look ahead a little bit to Genesis chapter 10. 